I'm going to invite you to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is our text for today, and uh, if you don't have a Bible or a Bible app on your device, that is perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you if you're at Sweetwater or McCulloch or at the table in the back if you're at our Parker campus, and turn to page 963, and you will find Matthew chapter 5. You'll find our text for today, and as always... If you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, you need one, you want to read God's Word, but you don't have access to it, please take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, there's a couple of things I just want to uh, tell you I am thrilled about and excited about and get to invite you to be a part of as well. Uh, first one is, is just a bonus, you know, Robert mentioned uh, summer camps earlier, and if you're at any of our campuses, you know, summer camps are coming up, and, and can I just tell you, if, if you have a child from kindergarten through high school, uh, make it a priority to send them to camp. And, and you might have all kinds of excuses why not, you, may, you know, maybe the first one is you can't afford it. Uh, we got scholarships available, and, and that's not a reason to not send your child to a, a life-changing opportunity with Jesus. So uh, can I just tell you, uh, don't let Satan lie to you and say, well, we can't do that, or you've got like four kids, or some people got seven in this church. So anyway, you got four kids, and, and you're like, there's no way they can scholarship all those. I can't. Yes, we can. Give us a chance. Let us bless your children, because we believe that this is a life-changing opportunity, and they don't get that many of those. Uh, so we just want to uh, encourage you. I want to encourage you personally, because uh, uh, I, I want to see your, the lives of your kids uh, impacted with the gospel. Second thing is, uh, a few weeks ago, we announced that we are partnering with Compassion International to build a Compassion Center in Honduras. Uh, this is going to be a church and, a, and a, a Compassion Center where people are being ministered to seven days a week. Uh, it's going to function as a spiritual place where people are hearing the gospel and they're worshiping and teaching. It's also going to be a place where kids can come and get food, can get health care, can get supplemental nutrition. They can, you know, get all those things that go with elevating kids from poverty. And it's $76,000 to build the building. It's about another $25,000 to furnish it. And right now, to this date, we've raised just under $49,000. And uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. With pledges for more uh, that are kind of like matching funds. So like they said, hey, we'll give up to uh, if you guys give. And so uh, I just want to encourage you to give as God leads you to. And, and because we're in the midst of this and because it's a, a pretty short time to raise this by the end of June, what we're going to do when, we, when you leave uh, any of our campuses, we're taking up a benevolence offering. We do that every time we celebrate communion. But this weekend only, 100% of what you drop in those buckets on your way out or plates or whatever they have uh, is going to go to fund the Compassion Center in Honduras. So this is a partnership opportunity. So uh, you guys are always generous when it comes to uh, benevolence and caring for those who are needy. Instead of the money going to those who are needy in Lake Havasu, this time only it's going to go to those who are needy in Honduras as we help to complete this project. So again, I just encourage you to give as God leads you to give because he is providing in miraculous ways, and that is exciting. So, happy Mother's Day. Yeah, some of the guys are like, yeah, happy Mother's Day. Hey, to celebrate moms, we decided we're going to talk about a subject that is part of every single mother's life. Anger. Right? Because if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. That's right. And happy wife. Happy life, absolutely. So you guys already know this stuff. See, this is right in the wheelhouse. And we can laugh about it, but it's so true because, you know, if most of us had a mom, and if you did, you made her angry. There's no doubt about that. You, you know, you made her angry at some point. In fact, some of us wonder how we lived through childhood, right? And because there's those moments when you thought your mom was going to end your life. You know, she's like, I brought you into this world. I can take you out and make another look just like you. You know, and she looks at you with this, and you know your mom's angry when she uses your whole name, right? For me, it's Clifford Chad Garrison, and you just go ahead and, and step up for the beating, right? Or, you know, they're really angry when they can't even get your name right, and they start with the oldest child and work their way down. The dog might be in there, too. 
right? I had older brothers. I'd just wait for it. You want to help them, but then that's just talking back, and so you're going to get smacked again, right? Or when you hear any of these phrases or variations of these phrases, and you know your mom is really angry, right? Like if she says, if I told you once, a thousand times. That's right. I've told you a thousand times. Or how about this one? If it were a snake, yeah, that was usually right after I couldn't find something in the pantry. Again, right? Or I have had it. Yeah, what is it with the hand? It only counts if the hand is involved, right? And it's always over their head. And I'm like, Mom, if you'd had it up to there, you'd be drowning. So you can't swim anyway, so that's not good. Or I am sick and tired. Yeah, that's right. And you better not, uh, better not finish that for them if they pause there because that's just going to make it worse. See, moms, uh, you excel at anger and forgiveness. That's why we're still here. And, uh, and we appreciate that. So what we're going to do today is we're going to hear Jesus teach on anger and reconciliation. And by the way, this isn't just for moms. This is for everyone because everyone either gets angry or has someone else get angry at them. So it applies to to us. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 21, this is what Jesus says to those who are listening. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. I want you to begin listening to Jesus by seeing the danger of anger. The danger of anger. Uh, Did you notice that Jesus equates anger with murder? You've heard it said, you shall not commit murder, and anyone who commits murder is guilty of judgment. But I say to you, if you are angry at your brother, you're guilty of judgment. He, 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 he's, he just does it right there. He says, if you're angry at someone, then you're guilty of murder. And, and see, most of the time, we don't think of anger in those terms, in terms of consequences. We don't, we don't think, well, it's not like I killed anybody. I just got mad. I just lost my temper. I just blew up. And Jesus says, uh, it's just as serious. We need to take this just as serious. And and so there's a danger to anger. So how do we understand this? Because we already acknowledge we all get angry. We all make other people angry. So uh, how do we really understand this? Well, first of all, anger is an emotion. Okay? It's not right or wrong. It's just an emotion. It's part of life. We all feel angry. Uh, Well, here, let's just find out. Have you ever felt angry? Anyone? Okay. Okay. Uh, some of you didn't raise your hand, so either you're asleep or you're just really bad liars. So uh, here's the thing. You felt angry, but God never tells us how to feel. He never commands us to have an emotional response to any part of life. He commands actions, not emotions. So we all get angry. And, and if you deny that you get angry, that's not really helpful either. Because uh, I used to do this. Can I just be honest? I, I was somebody who said, oh, no, I'm, I'm not angry. I'm frustrated. I'm irritated. I'm annoyed. No, the truth was I'm angry. So we need to be honest about what we're feeling. And if you're feeling angry, go ahead and acknowledge I'm feeling angry. So be honest with your feelings and why you're feeling that way. Do you guys know why you get angry? The, the two primary reasons we get angry is selfishness because we're not getting our way. Right? So if somebody's driving slower than you want to go, blocking the lane on the highway, you feel angry because they're not doing what you want them to do. They're not getting out of your way. They're impeding your, uh, your progress. You're being selfish, right? So when somebody does something, you know, they bring the, the, the wrong meal at, at that, uh, you know, restaurant, and you feel anger welling up inside of you because they got your order wrong again, you know, that, that's selfishness. Or we get angry because of pride, right? Somebody offends our pride. They, they, you know, insult us. They don't give us the honor that's due. They, they don't give us the respect that's due. They don't invite us to the party. And we get angry 
because our pride has been offended. That's why we get angry for the most part. Uh, But we need to be honest with that. And here's the key thought coming out of Jesus' conversation about anger, and that is that destructive anger is sin. Destructive anger is sin. Uh, The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil a foothold or an opportunity. You see, when we follow our angry feelings, okay, you're going to feel anger. You're going to feel angry at some point. But when you follow those angry feelings and you begin to hurt people, destroy relationships, blow things up, you know, harm others, whether that's physically, verbally, or or any other way, then it's sin. And it's always sin when you do that. When you follow the anger and act on it destructively, uh, it's wrong. So feeling angry isn't sinful. Some of you need to go ahead and breathe a sigh of relief right now because you feel guilty every time you feel angry. Feeling angry isn't wrong. But destroying people because you're angry is always wrong. And by the way, following your anger it leads to a poisoned soul. I mean, it leads to, to you just being filled with bitterness and rage and malice and, 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 and you're just mad all the time at the world and everything sets you off and, and, and you just, you know, everything you touch becomes toxic. All the relationships you have become toxic because your soul is poisoned. And I don't know if you, if you caught this, but... Jesus was really clear that destructive anger inhibits worship. Destructive anger inhibits worship. Uh, He said, if you've got something against your brother, then uh, leave your gift at the altar and go reconcile. It gets in the way. And, and, And here's the thing. You cannot worship and celebrate a God of grace with an angry, unforgiving heart. Let me say that again. You cannot worship and celebrate a God of grace with an angry, unforgiving heart. Uh, You know what I noticed? Angry people, they want to worship the God of judgment. Angry preachers want to preach out of prophecy. Because they're like, yeah, you're all going to burn. Think about it. You know, judgment and vengeance, that's, that's the God of wrath is what they want. See, if you're angry and unforgiving and you enter into God's presence... One of two things is going to happen. Either you're going to confess your unforgiveness and you're going to repent and you're going to forgive that person or persons. You're going to let go of that anger and that hatred uh, that's inside of you and you're going to let God's grace just cleanse your soul. And there, and if God's grace cleanses your soul, you're going to give God's grace to those people who've hurt you. Or your heart's going to grow hard. And you're going to grow cold and distant from God. And, and, and you're going to gravitate. If you, can, if you continue in worship, you're going to gravitate toward the angry church. You're going to gravitate toward the judgment and wanting to condemn everybody. And, and, um, and I just think that's sad. And you need to understand, this is a spiritual issue that we're talking about. This is a spiritual issue about our heart and how we're approaching God and how we're approaching our brothers. Uh, and... and This chapter is all about issues that Jesus wants us to deal with, and he begins by talking about anger. So this is a spiritual issue. This is not an issue of your ethnicity. Okay, don't don't blame your anger on the fact that you're Irish or German or Greek or Mexican. God does not care. He made you. He knows you. Okay, no excuse on your ethnicity. And it's not about your family heritage because, hey, I just grew up in a family where everybody just yelled all the time. Okay, they taught you that. You rebelled about other things. Rebel about that. You don't have to follow that lead just because you were taught that. This is simply about obedience and submission to Jesus. So please hear Jesus' warning about the danger of anger And hear the priority of reconciliation. The priority of reconciliation is is so strong in this. Listen to this again at verse 23. 
So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer the gift. Now we can hear those words, but you know what we can't do is easily enter into the context. Because most of us think, okay, so if I'm really angry at somebody and, and all, then I probably shouldn't take communion when they observe it later on. And so you're like, I'll pass communion, and then I'll just go out, and I'll, I'll make it okay with them. But, but that's not their situation. Think about this. Jesus is talking to a bunch of people who are Jewish, right? And so there was one place that the Jews could go and make a sacrifice. That's Jerusalem at the temple. Most Jews did not, in that day and time, live in Jerusalem. Most Jews were scattered around the Roman world. In other words, they had to make a pilgrimage. They had to travel for days or weeks or months and, and spend a lot of money to get to Jerusalem to make a sacrifice. And Jesus said, hey, if you're there and you're about to make a sacrifice and you realize that your brother has something against you, leave the sacrifice. Go and reconcile to your brother. Now, that's lunacy because some of them have been traveling for months to get there. They've spent all kinds of money and time. And, and you know what Jesus is saying? He's saying, hey, reconciliation is more important than the major act of worship in your culture. D did you hear that? Reconciliation with your brother is more important than any act of worship that you can uh, be involved in. This is radical. This turns priorities upside down. Because all up to this time, people thought, well, if I have to be right with God, it doesn't matter about anybody else. I have to be right with God. All these other people I can be, you know, at odds with. But if I bring the right sacrifice to God, then I'm good with God. And Jesus, who is God in the flesh, says, no, leave the gift at the altar. Doesn't matter. Reconciliation is more important than any religious activity that you can be involved in. That is turning our world upside down if we'll listen to Jesus. You see, God wants us to pursue peace. Pursue peace. Actively, intentionally, seek peace in relationships. He says, leave the gift. Go, be reconciled. You do it. That shouldn't surprise anyone because just a few verses earlier, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Peacemakers, not like peace receivers. Not like, you know, you know peace recipients, peacemakers, people who are actively involved in pursuing peace. They're the ones who are going to be called the children of God. So he wants us to take the initiative. You know what Jesus is saying? And, and, and I'm just going to, and I don't know what kind of churches you grew up in, but he's calling out a lot of the people that I grew up with in church, in the churches, because there's a lot of passive-aggressive disobedience in the church of God. You know what I heard growing up? Well, I'm just going to wait for an apology. I'm going to wait for them to apologize. They, they, they need to ask for forgiveness, and I will forgive them when they ask for forgiveness. And you know what Jesus says? He, he just calls that a load. I'm just telling you, he goes, I want you to leave the gift and you go and reconcile. You initiate this reconciliation. Don't wait for it. Don't wait for an apology. Don't wait for them to come begging for forgiveness. You go offer it. You go start the ball rolling. You lead out. And so often in relationships, we play games, don't we? It's their fault. I didn't do anything. I'm ready to forgive them. As soon as they show up, I'll do it. That's just playing a game. And here's the thing, that may sound really good to your friends. It just doesn't sound good to Jesus. You see, you take the initiative. So I want you to understand this. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're here and you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross for your sins and he was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then God expects you to do what he did. God expects you to follow his example. So here's a couple of like really simple questions that I think everybody in here can get. Who broke the relationship between God and people? 
We did, right? We did. We're the, we're the ones who, who rebelled against God. As our ancestors first, we followed in their footsteps. All of us have sinned. All of us come short of the glory of God. So we broke the relationship between God and people. So who fixed the relationship between God and people? Yeah, Jesus did. Right? God took the initiative, and he sent his one and only son into the world to be the sacrifice for your sins and my sins while we were being rebellious brats. That, that's taking the initiative, isn't it? Can you imagine if God had said, well, I'll wait for them to come and ask. We'd all just be cruising right along on our way to hell, getting what we deserved, right? Getting exactly what we deserved. But God instead pursued peace with us. He took the initiative, even though, you know, we didn't care about him. So pursue peace. And if you pursue peace, I'm just going to tell you right now, this will turn your relationships upside down. This will change the dynamic in every relationship you have if you will be the one who instigates peace. But if you're going to do that, this is going to be hard to hear for some of you. Repent of being right and focus on relationships. Repent of being right. Right now, some of you are, you know, I mean, not doing it physically folding your arms, but inside, you're like, but I am right. Um, so who believes that they're pretty much always right? Okay, everyone who didn't raise their hand, I'm calling you out on it right now. Because you really believe that you're right about the stuff that you believe. Because there's not one person in this room who's like, I know I'm wrong, but I believe it anyway. I know it's just crazy, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend like I believe. And no, you don't pre- it's if you, you only believe stuff if you actually think it's correct. And so now how strongly you believe it, that, that's not negotiable. But you believe what you believe, and you think you're right. Because if you think you're wrong, you're going to change your beliefs. So we all pretty much believe we're always right. And relationships are broken because I'm right and you're wrong, right? That, that's the dynamic. We start arguing over stuff, whether it's behavior or whether it's values or politics or ideas or money or family decisions. You know, I'm right and you're wrong, and so our relationship becomes broken because both people or both families believe they've been wronged. I know this because I have counseled couples through the years. I know this because I've watched families fight at funerals through the years. And both sides are waiting for the others to apologize. And they're both demanding an apology. You owe me an apology. And, and they both think that they're right. And you know what the reality is? They're both wrong. They're both wrong. That's why we need to repent of being right, because we're, we're wrong. There's two reasons we're wrong. The first one is we're sinners. And so we do wrong as our nature. Think about that. We'll talk about that in a second. Second reason that we're wrong is because we're not pursuing reconciliation. Right? What did Jesus say? If you realize that you have something against your brother, your brother has something against you, leave your gift, go and be reconciled. If the relationship is broken and you're not doing anything to fix it, you're in sin. You're wrong. So we need to repent of being right and focus on relationships. Because think about this. Because of sin... We're not really arguing about who is right and who is wrong. Because of sin, we're all wrong. We're all tainted. We all don't see it from the correct perspective. And so when you're arguing with somebody, what you're really arguing about is who is less wrong. Now think about this. It loses a lot of weight when you go, I'm less wrong than you. I mean, we're both wrong, but I'm less wrong. It takes all the fun out of winning an argument, doesn't it? Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. I'm less wrong than you. They, you, you, right now you go, yeah, that's, I want to repent of that. See, here's the reality. God is right. The Bible uses the word righteous. Righteous, which just means God is right. Always, period. You know what word the Bible uses to describe us? Unrighteous. You know what that means? That means that you and I are unright. I think that means we're wrong. We're just, we're just wrong. We think wrong. We act wrong. We say wrong stuff. We do wrong things. We're really good at being wrong. And yeah, here's what God did. 
God sacrificed his rightness to redeem the relationship with you and with me. He was right, we were wrong, and he sacrificed his rightness for us. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul, writing to the, the church in Corinth, says, In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them, and he has given to us the message of reconciliation. Isn't that cool? God was in Jesus so that he could take his righteousness and apply it to us to bring us into relationship with him so that we could have a, a, a redeemed relationship with the living God for all eternity. That, see, that's pursuing peace. And that's what God expects his kids to do because it's a family thing. And, and just as the father does that, he wants his kids to do that. Just as Jesus does that, he wants his followers to do that. You see, we deserve hell, and God has every right to send us to hell. But God values relationships over being right. He's still always right, but he still values relationship more than winning an argument. So he saved us. He redeemed us. He reconciled us by sacrificing Jesus he pursued peace with us, and because of that, we get heaven when we deserve hell, and that's the good news of the gospel, and that's what we want you to hear. And if you don't know that good news, that's what we want you to receive and be reconciled to God. But if you know Jesus as Savior, then he wants you to pursue peace with people. Not passively, but aggressively, actively, constantly. So what are you going to do? I mean, seriously, what are you going to do? Are you going to be an angry, bitter, hateful person that defends your rightness all the time? Or are you going to be a person of forgiveness and reconciliation and peace? Because God expects his followers to always forgive and to always reconcile when it's possible. Notice I said when it's possible. We were talking through this as a, as a team, and we realized there's a few situations when it's really not possible to reconcile with someone. It doesn't mean you don't try, but there's some situations where you can't. You can't reconcile if the person's unwilling. But you can try and be rejected. It's okay. There's a lot of people who say no to Jesus. So there are some people who are unwilling. There's some people you can't reconcile with because um, it's unsafe. You know, they're just unsafe. If you're a victim of abuse, uh, of assault, uh, you, you may be able to forgive them from a distance, but you don't need to reconcile that relationship because if it puts you at risk again. You can learn a lot from Celebrate Recovery and the 12 Steps about making amends and, and doing that, and that's one of the things that, that they teach. And sometimes you can't reconcile because they're unavailable. Some of you are still angry at people who've, who've already died. And you can't have that conversation, but you can forgive them. And that's a conversation you may need to have with God. You may need to have it with a pastor or a counselor. You may need to ask some other people to pray with you and help you to figure that out. But, but always forgive and reconcile when it's possible. But be a person of forgiveness and reconciliation and peace. You see, I know what Jesus did. And I know what he's calling his children to do. So are you going to leave here and pursue peace? Here's what I know. If you'll do that, God will turn your relationships upside down and God will demonstrate his power in your life. He will. He'll demonstrate his power in your life. Um, and if you do that, that may, may mean that you'll surprise some people with a phone call or an email uh, or maybe even a text apology. Hey, I'm sorry. Sorry I did that. Sorry I said that. Sorry I left you out. Sorry I was rude. Sorry. Um, it may mean making an uncomfortable phone call to a parent or a child or a sibling or maybe an old friend. But it will mean living with a different attitude. That's okay because it's a Jesus attitude. 
Because he said, blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called children of God. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for pursuing peace with us. We don't deserve it. We didn't want it. We didn't seek it out. But you still sent Jesus into this world to be the sacrifice for sins when we still didn't care. So we simply pause uh, to recognize your gift and and to tell you that we love you. And we want to love you better and we want to love you more. um, And yet we fail so often. But if we're really serious about loving you, that means that we're going to love our neighbor, even the ones that are annoying, even the ones that have hurt us, even the ones that have broken our hearts and our lives. Uh, You want us to forgive. So communicate mercy and grace to us and through us in Jesus' name.